Welcome everyone. My name is Martha Madsen and I direct New Hampshire Civics, the New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education, if we're being formal. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon to celebrate 50 years of youth franchise and youth office holders. Uh, for 50 years now, 18 year olds have enjoyed the rights to vote and to run for office due to the 26th Amendment, which was ratified 50 years ago in 1971. The mission of the New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education um, is to develop, nurture, and maintain an informed, engaged, and civil New Hampshire citizenry. We're nonpartisan, and all of our services are provided free of charge. We host public events like this one, and provide student programming like New Hampshire's Kid Governor and organize professional development for educators in civics education. For educators in the audience, Amanda McGuire has created a powerful set of lessons for middle and high school around this material and in honor of this anniversary. So Amanda, if you're there, if you could put the link to that in the chat, that would be great. Um, and speaking of the chat, if you have questions for our featured guests and our speakers, please pose them in the chat function. Um, and just for your information, this event is being recorded. So today we will begin with a history lesson and end with a discussion among young New Hampshire representatives of both parties. Um, by way of introduction, I would like to begin with a proclamation from Governor Christopher Sununu. In the year of our Lord, 2021, Youth Franchise and Youth Office Holder Day, May 13th, 2021. Whereas May 13th, 2021 marks the 50th anniversary of New Hampshire's ratification of the 26th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which granted the right to vote and the eligibility to hold office in the state to citizens who are 18 years and older. And whereas the 26th Amendment was signed into law on July 1st, 1971 by President Richard Nixon, allowing millions of young people to vote in the 1972 election. And whereas on this anniversary, we celebrate the hard work and advocacy of the young people who fought for the right to vote and recognize the many contributions of young voters throughout the last 50 years. And whereas young people throughout New Hampshire are highly involved in all aspects of the political process, from voting to holding office, and they work diligently to ensure their voices are heard. Whereas young adults are the future of our nation and we celebrate the anniversary of their franchisement and honor their place in our democracy. Now, therefore, I, Christopher T. Sununu, governor of the state of New Hampshire, do hereby proclaim May 13th, 2021, as Youth Franchise and Youth Office Holder Day in the state of New Hampshire and call this to the attention of all citizens. So um, with that, um, there are many accomplished individuals here today who've participated um, in different ways and their full biographies are on our website, which is nhcivics.org. I will introduce first um, our set of speakers very briefly so we can begin the conversation um, as soon as possible. First, Representative Mel Myler, um, who is serving his fifth term in the New Hampshire House. Currently the ranking Democrat on the House Education Committee. He is the retired executive director of NEA New Hampshire 
and the former director of field operations for the National Education Association. In 1967, Mel was the initial organizer of Project 18, which founded the Youth Franchise Coalition and ultimately coordinated the grassroots effort to achieve the 26th Amendment. We have Representative Rennie Cushing here, who is serving his eighth term in the New Hampshire House, where he represents Hampton. Uh, among his many involvements are serving as moderator for the Winnicunit School District and serving as vice chair at the New Hampshire Constitutional Convention in 1984. Today, Representative Cushing will speak about the movement in New Hampshire to allow 18-year-olds to vote. Les Francis is a policy leader and a public affairs strategist he joins us from California today. Mr. Francis serves, uh, served as Deputy Assistant and Deputy White House Chief of Staff to President Jimmy Carter. He has managed or advised campaigns for office at every level of government. He will share with us some of his perspectives um, as one of the original organizers of the campaign that resulted in the passage and ratification of the 26th Amendment. And Patricia Kiefer is here. Um, she's the Director of International Affairs at the American Federation of Teachers. She has played a leadership role in the, in the US and globally working on political and constitutional reforms, advocating for women's rights, voting rights, and youth political participation. She holds a fellowship appointment at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. She served as co-chair of the national campaign to amend the U.S. Constitution with the ratification of the 26th Amendment. Ian McGowan is here. He joins us from Seattle. He's a retired lawyer and lobbyist who will speak about his role with the youth franchise movement 50 years ago. So first, Representative Myler will start us off and begin the lesson um, in history with a description of the context and how this movement began. Um, I'm going to ask each speaker to consider sharing their ages at the time so we can kind of picture who you were at that point and uh, sharing a personal reason, you know, some of the personal reasons for becoming involved. So Representative Myler, would you begin? Whoops, he's muted. Hold on. First, you have to un unmute. Uh, thanks, thanks, <laughs> okay. Martha. Okay. At the time, at the, at the time, I think I was must have been about 22, 23 when we started this thing. Uh, let me first put in the context of what it was like in the late 60s. It, it was it was chaotic. Uh, we had the uh, Vietnam War movement. Uh, we had the uh, student free speech movement on college campuses, and we had the civil rights movement. All of these had one common theme. And that was to, to get a voice in the system that was affecting young people's lives. At the time, I was the student uh, president of the Student California Teachers Association. I was studying to be a teacher. And we brought forth to our parent organization, the California Teachers Association, a resolution to lower the voting age. It passed overwhelmingly. That following summer, I was also the president of the Student National Education Association. And we brought forth that proposition to the NEA body. The NEA Representative Assembly is a 10,000 member organization. It acts like a, a town meeting. We uh, brought that uh, proposition forward and a resolution and it was passed. That summer, I was then hired by the NEA to work with their student programs. And one of the first things I did when I got back to the NEA was I went to the Assistant Executive Director, Cecil Hannon, and I said, Mr. Hannon, we've got this resolution. Are we just gonna let it sit on the shelf of indecision? Or are we gonna do something about it? And he said, what do you need now? I said, I need some money. I need a grant. He gave me a grant of, I wanna say, some say it was 40,000, some say it was 100,000, but the point is we got a grant. And at that point in time, uh, we had that money and we, knew it that we also knew that we couldn't do it as an organization, that we needed to broaden the scope and be more inclusive and get others. Because what was happening across the country in states in Kentucky, Georgia, Oregon, 
they were already moving to lower the voting age. And we knew that we needed to have it as a federal amendment rather than on a state by state basis. So I brought back Les Francis, who was a friend of mine. We had done some political organizing within the organization and he was a political operative. So Les came back and you have to remember these were student teachers now. While you had those who were out on the street who were raising hell, frankly, we then be able to say we wanted to work within the system. So there's a question about a revolutionary approach or an evolutionary approach. And we chose obviously the evolutionary approach to work within the organizations, within the system, to try to change that system through the plebiscite, through voting. Uh, we, we knew that we needed to bring more as Les and I began working on this thing. We needed to expand it because there are other people who are working on this individually too. So how would we begin to do that? How would we form an organization that would bring in the multiple people into one single organization that could provide the, the, the shibboleth for this thing and create the spirit of this thing in a bipartisan way that could have an impact upon 12 million new voters to bring forth in the election. So we brought forth back less and we worked on it. And then we said, well, let's, let's form a thing which was called the Youth Franchise Coalition. Well, how the hell are we gonna do that? Frankly, we didn't know what we were doing. We were young. We were just going with what our hearts were telling us and what we thought was right. And so we brought Ian McGowan in, who had been a lobbyist here in uh, Washington, uh, worked with Les on a number of different issues. And, Les was, and, and Ian was brought in to basically take this to another level of more engagement, et cetera. And all what we were trying to do was to find the common ground, find that common ground within the system that would allow 12 million new voters to engage and find their voice through the ballot box. So Ian, I'm gonna let you talk about the Youth Franchise Coalition. Ian, if you could unmute yourself. I was about 30 at the time and Les talked to me about the Youth Franchise Coalition they were putting together and it was something with the I was bothered by the war. I was curious about the war, and uh, it was a chance to, to 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 do something. So we started out with a with this coalition. They had put together the coalition with the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights. It had civil rights groups. It had um, League of Women Voters. It had churches. It had a, a whole range of organizations working on civil rights issues, and. Uh, that was the partnership with NEA that made it all come together and, and, together and gave it a, a broad base. Um, we started looking at the Hill, trying to figure out what was going on, why things hadn't happened. It had been introduced by Senator Jennings Randolph from West Virginia for years and nothing happened. And people would praise the idea and periodically they would have hearings, but it never moved. So we did our first analysis trying to figure out how, how we approach Congress, how we start building this issue up. The other area we had to work in was all these activities that were going in the country and state campaigns. And they were generated locally. Some of them with student NEA people, some with young Republicans and young Democrats. They were all bipartisan. They were young people oriented and young people based. And with that combination of student NEA and NEA and then the grassroots work that we're going, there was a nucleus in Ohio, New Jersey, uh, Washington, Oregon, Massachusetts, a lot of other states. And we started teaming up with those groups. So we had the resources in Washington <clears throat> to put together the history and provide materials. We were able to coordinate between the leaders of different campaigns. We were able to coordinate with secretaries of state who were involved in elections and have material that they could use on a local level. But they did that work on the states on their own. And we were, we were helping. That's how I ran into Pat Kiefer. Ohio was a significant state and a significant campaign. And Pat was running the campaign in Ohio along with Clark Weidman 
Clark was the head of the young, Dem young Republicans and Pat was uh, head of the younger Democrats. They had a tremendous campaign and we became friends working on it together. And this was a perfect combination. I had the political experience in Washington, but Pat had the, the grassroots ability to, to, to mobilize people. And the combination there, that's why she became the co-director. She came to Washington, D.C., and that was the, the, the combination. We started working then on the Hill and fostering other activities in other states with, with grassroots activities. On the Hill, we started making contacts with, with the staff of people who were friends. We, you know, both parties, we had, um, we had Senator Kennedy, Senator Bai that were interested. Uh, on the Republican side, we had Marlo Cook, we had um, Senator Scott from Pennsylvania. Their staff, because, of, because they were interested in the issue, started working with us. They, we had gave them the coordination. They gave us the, the, the ability to have the contacts in Congress and that gradually built up. Here again, the war movement was going on on the outside. We were working on the Hill and the state campaigns, but nothing was happening. And the reality came when we, you know, as we got into the, the, the metrics of Congress was there were certain people in both parties that really didn't want it to happen. The threat to them wasn't, it wasn't the war, the issue it was their political future. And Congressman Manny Seller um, had in a power position of leadership had stopped the issue and it was never a public stop. It was a situation where this things just didn't happen. So our dilemma was to um, how to get how to get over that hurdle. Pat, I think you can come in now and start talking about as, as we started moving. You came to Washington, we were co-directing it and we started with a lobby effort on Congress. And okay. Um. Is my mic on? Is it proverbial Zoom call? Can you hear me? Um, so I was uh, probably 24, 25 at the time. I um, don't think the age is important, but um, what I do think is important, Wendy, is that all of us here, regardless of our organizational or political orientation at the time, grew up in our politics at the time of John F. Kennedy's call to young people to engage in the political system, to engage in what you could give to the political system. I was a product of that. I mean, I was in high school at the time, but even as a sophomore in high school, I was a Kennedy girl, right? I was, I aspired to get politically involved. And there was no career path for that at the time. Um, and so the motivation that took me to get involved with the effort to lowering the voting age was very personal to me. Um, my brother was what you would call poster child for the campaign. Um, he was killed in Vietnam in 1968. Um, he was a Marine, and I was involved in local politics in Ohio, and I felt that there had to be more to politics than uh, Hubert Humphrey and, and um, other candidates, and that if I was going to make this work for me, I wanted to get wholly involved in, a poli in policy issues, in issues. And um, there was nothing stronger than voting rights, more, more relevant to making change than voting rights. Um, and so the 18 year old vote was something that was obviously right there. Um, and I um, graduated from college and had my first job at newspaper in Cincinnati and quit that job to go and run the campaign in Ohio. And that's where I met Les and, and Ian. Um, and when it was over, we lost as everyone expected we would do but no one expected that we would come within 1% of passing a constitutional amendment in Ohio. And so Les asked me to um, join the team at the Youth Franchise Coalition in Washington 
in late 69, early 70. Um, and what I'm gonna tell you is the path to the constitutional amendment um, because it was an unbelievable time. I mean, I was not a seasoned lobbyist. I wasn't out of a big institution. Um, I didn't have that kind of discipline to me. I was an activist. I was a political activist. Um, I was on the street um, in a peaceful demonstration and giving voice um, to the anti-war effort, particularly and to civil rights in my community, to open housing, to voting rights. Um, so I was very much of an activist. Um, all through, 60, through um, 70 and 71, when I was in Washington working with Ian, um, I spent my weekends for the most part in anti-war demonstrations. Um, I believe, if, and I look back on it in terms of where I've been in my life, I believe it was, and reflecting on it, it was a convenient, um, complementary inside outside kind of approach. Um, you needed both the inside lobbying, the more institutionalized approach, um, the sort of um, actions that would take place in the YWCA and the student NEA, um, as well as the actions that would take place by some of our organizations like the NAACP Youth Council and SNCC and some of the more, and the National Student Association. So this, when Ian says when, that this was a large umbrella, it was an immense umbrella. Um, the Future Farmers of America has much role as um, student NEA. Um, we had very strong grassroots support in rural America and Appalachia, America. And I want, your, I want to think just for a quick moment here, when I got to Washington, Ian and Les were talking about mending the Constitution. That is amazing. I mean, you just don't go and amend the Constitution, right? Um, now, it's true the Constitutional Amendment had been um, introduced um, in every Congress since the Second World War. Um, and in fact, it actually got to the floor. Uh, of the Congress in, uh, I think it was 1968, uh, Lyndon Johnson um, in 67 or 68 had a commission that recommended lowering the voting age to 18. And because it was Lyndon Johnson, it actually got out of committee and got to the floor, but it didn't pass. You needed three quarters of, three, two thirds of the United States Congress in both the Senate and the House in you would need 38 states to ratify in their state legislatures. And to do that, you'd have to take it to 50 states. Think of the enormity of it. That's why there are only 17 amendments since the first 10 amendments, which was the Bill of Rights. But we didn't think about that every day. It wasn't like, this is gonna, this is gonna stop us. It gave us, we were challenged by the idea. Um, and shortly after getting to Washington, Senator Birch Bayh from Indiana, who chaired the Constitutional Amendment Subcommittee of the U.S. Senate, was going to hold hearings on a constitutional amendment. And this in itself was a breakthrough. Um, again, no one ever expected the Constitutional Amendment to get out of the Judiciary Committee. Um, but Bai felt it was important to re-engage in this issue and to raise it. Um, and so he had hearings and Senator Kennedy came to the hearing and Senator Kennedy said, basically, you don't need to do this with a constitutional amendment. You can do it in a simple law. You can do it legislatively. I have here this article written by Archibald Cox for the Harvard Law Review that says, according to the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, Congress has the power to, um, to, to, to legislate a lower voting age. Now, it wasn't the first time that had been talked about, um, but it was viable. And Senator Kennedy was passionate about it. It was part of a Kennedy legacy. It was a very personal thing to him and that his whole life and the life of his family is dedicated to political involvement. And he wanted to make this happen. 
and like so many others saw the impossibility of a constitutional amendment that would lower the voting age. And so he consulted and worked with Senator Mansfield was from Montana and the majority leader of the Senate and Senator Magnuson from Washington State who knew Ian very well, who chaired the, um, who chaired the, the Commerce Committee. And these were two rather senior senators, very senior, senior in the Senate. And they were basically what they worked out with Kennedy was they were cover for Kennedy. They could put together a bipartisan coalition to support the legislation and they figured that they would amend the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act was a product of the civil rights movement. It had originally been passed in the, in the Congress in 1965. It was enacted. It was a very important achievement for the civil rights movement. And they decided they would attach an amendment to lower the voting age. Now, it wasn't popular by, with everyone. A lot of the civil rights organizations did not want any amendments um, to the Voting Rights Act, but Kennedy persisted. I remember there was a meeting with which Kennedy called in the, um, the leaders of the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights into his office, and they were giving him this reason and that reason why they didn't want the 18-year-old vote on the renewal of the Voting Rights Act, and he got very angry and he just stood up and said the meeting's over and we're going forward. Um, so the Congress did pass the amendment to the Voting Rights Act and then passed the Voting Rights Act with overwhelming majorities. Um, and they, um, and that was in July of, um, of 1970. And Nixon said that he, he was president, and he said, while he supported lower the voting age, he wasn't sure that this was the right way to do it. And he immediately uh, told the Justice Department that they had to expedite a review of this um, and take this to the courts to see whether or not it was constitutional. And it was an expedited court review. Um, now remember, 18-year-olds um, could vote as soon as that law was passed. Um, and Ian and I and others in the coalition put together an effort to begin to register voters for the 1972 elections. Um, and the court process started grinding, um, not very quickly, but quickly enough. Um, and this test of the constitutionality got to the Supreme Court in the late fall, and they decided on Christmas Eve. And the court had a split decision. Four judges opposed it, and four judges said Congress had the power to do it. And the deciding judge was Supreme Court Justice Blackman, who ruled that Congress had the power to do this for federal elections, but not for other elections, only federal elections. So what you ended up with, with the Supreme Court decision, was the ability to go out and register 18 to 21 year olds for federal elections. They could actually vote but not the state and local elections. Well, immediately, Senator Bai said, sent every Secretary of State a letter saying, what does this do to your election system? And back then we didn't have much in terms of electronic voter registration systems. Everything was still done by paper. Um, there were a few electronic ballot systems, but not a whole lot. And so they, um, Secretary of State said, this is chaos. Um, we're going to have to have two, elect, two voter registration systems, two voter registration rolls. We're going to have to have different ballots. Um, this is just chaos. And so Senator Bai decided with the leaders of Congress to immediately reintroduce the constitutional amendment. Um, and we went together, we went to a lobbying coalition with election officers around the country, with secretaries of state, with state legislators like yourselves, um, and paved the way to get a constitutional amendment. The Congress passed a constitutional amendment with the required two thirds majorities in both houses in record time in three months, in three months and sent it to the states. And as soon as they sent it to the states, 
the states were ready to ratify. Six states ratified on the first day that Congress acted. Um, and so states were ready. They had been asking for this. They were ready to go. And all those activists that we had involved in the previous year's efforts, people who had been involved in waiting for state referendums and, and trying to pass this thing locally, were ready for this. There was a momentum that took place. And that was our strategy, create a ratification momentum. Because if you didn't do it before July 1, you were going to lock it over into legislative sessions that would take place in 1972. And that was going to further make more chaos um, with primaries and early registration processes. So the amendment was ratified by July 1 when Ohio became the 38th state to ratify. So that's the story that I have on how this process worked. Thank you for that incredible history. Um, uh, Representative Cushing, could you speak very briefly about what it was like in New Hampshire um, when all this happened? You have to unmute. It's great to hear from all these grownups because I was a kid, I was 14, 15, and 16 when this was taking place. And, you know, my cousin Ralphie came back from Vietnam in a chair with stumps in, instead of legs um, in 1996. And I became, you know, I became opposed to the war in Vietnam and had to act on it. And this is a time when, you know, kids would graduate from high school and before full cycle of seasons, they'd come back in body bags. Um, and I can't tell you, you know, what that was like, but I, I did anything I could to try to stop the war. First thing I did is I became involved with a Dump Johnson movement uh, that Al Lowenstein organized and volunteered for, going door to door for Gene McCarthy for president in the 68 presidential primary here in New Hampshire. And um, I remember the ads that were put out by the then democratic leadership, democratic governor, democratic senator that said a vote for McCarthy was a vote for Hanoi. And my first experience was being red baited because I was opposed to the war in, in Vietnam. Um, when that failed, when, you know, I, I was disappointed that he didn't win in New Hampshire, but ultimately Johnson was, you know, was replaced. Um, and I continued, I was one of those ones, but I didn't distinguish between inside and outside. To me, whether I was, you know, standing and doing a two-man picket line in Hampton opposed to the war or, you know, lobbying, it was everything. Um, I was in high school uh, with some help of this guy, Bud Dunphy, who was an elder you know, gave some advice. Uh, we, I organized high school students um, in my own school through the New Hampshire Association of Student Councils. We had high school students throughout the state who mobilized because we wanted the state legislature to lower the voting age. I became convinced that we would end the war if only I could vote, um, if only people who were 18 to 21 and accepted the notion that, you know, if you're old enough to go over to Vietnam and, and kill and die, you should be old enough to vote. So in our state, you know, we mobilized, we ended up getting a you know, constitutional amendment introduced in the, in the state legislature to lower the voting age from 21 to 18. And I remember you know, going to Reps Hall, um, testifying at a public hearing because that's where it was, um, having the leaders of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party supporting our effort, um, testifying from the heart, from the well, um, making what I thought was a really persuasive argument got to go to the speaker's office. Marshall Cobley was there, walked around, said we were going to be able to do it. And then, um, you know, organized the demonstration at rally the first time we had a march in front of the state house that the high school kids organized. We were sure that we were going to win. And then the vote came and we got clobbered. That was the reality of what it was like. That was a bit, you know, disillusioning. Um, but it was a great, you know, it was a great effort. We had you know, involved college students at UNH and Plymouth, but it was really, it was high school. I, will, I was one of the foot soldiers in the movement that all these people on the Zoom were, were leading. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm quick. I, I, I could tell great stories about the details of what it was like, but my takeaway from it was um, even though we got clobbered and we lost in the end in a couple of, you know, within a short period of time, the federal uh, constitutional amendment was, came, there was momentum in, in New Hampshire, like every place else, to get this thing out of the way because, you know, it was maybe, maybe did, was done to placate some, some of us. And I, you know, 
it was a great moment when in 1972, I got to go into the voting booth and vote, um, you know, for president of the United States, vote for governor, vote for elected office. That's the quick story. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Les Francis is going to just give us an overall summary and, and um, talk about just how broad that coalition was. Les, can you unmute? Okay, thank you, uh, Martha. And, and, uh, and let me start by uh, uh, congratulating you and, and everybody in New Hampshire for commemorating uh, this uh, historic event. This is terrific. Uh, and and uh, such commemorations are going on uh, around the country to celebrate the, the passage and ratification of the 26th Amendment. Uh, before I sort of summarize a few of the points made, let, let me just uh, make a, a couple of points. One, uh, and I've said this, my colleagues have heard me say this ad nauseum, but the whole way that played out with the Voting Rights Act and the Supreme Court decision and then having to, to go back to the Constitutional Amendment uh, proves an adage that I found to be true throughout my uh, career in politics, that it's better to be lucky than smart. Uh, it, it just worked out in such a way that the way events went uh, paved the way for the constitutional amendment and, and all the groundwork that had been laid. It's true, and I was 26, I guess, when Mel uh, invited me to come back to, to NEA. We were all in our 20s. I mean, Ian was the grand old man of the, of the effort at, at 30. Um, but it's also true that we benefited from the advice and guidance of uh, elders, if you, as it were. Uh, uh, sort of ironic that, that here we are, gray hairs, and, and we counted on gray hairs at the time to help us. But uh, leaders of the labor movement, AFL-CIO, the United Auto Workers, NEA, the civil rights leadership, um, uh, they all provided important counsel to us and strategic guidance and support when it mattered. So yes, it was largely a youth movement, but it was a youth movement that benefited from uh, the tutelage, if you will, of people who'd been around the block. Uh, Evie Dubrow from the Garment Workers Union was a, a, a key advisor. So it's important to recognize that. And uh, and of course, now here we are, the gray hairs. But um, just a few key points that have been covered, uh, but I think are worth repeating. One is it was a true grassroots movement. Uh, this was not a top down thing. Uh, yes, we had key supporters, and particularly the Senate, some of the House, but the effort started at the grassroots and was carried out to grassroots by volunteers. Uh, people like Rennie, others who, who uh, caught, caught the bug and got involved, hundreds of thousands of people ultimately across the country. Um, the, uh, it was bipartisan, or I like to phrase transpartisan. Uh, there were Republicans, there were Democrats, uh, there were people whose motivations were political, but certainly not partisan. Uh, and non-ideological. Yes, the war was a catalytic factor, but it wasn't the only factor. And, and uh, our coalition, uh, we made a decision, a messaging decision that we weren't going to make it about the war because we didn't want the, the, the vote on the vote to be a proxy for the war. But that was obviously the dominant public conversation. We just didn't we didn't uh, use it as such. Our strategy was, as Mel indicated, look, we were young and, and, and sort of didn't know what we were doing. And that, that's true. Our strategy was to try anything and everything. So we worked trying to get state legislatures to act and pass bills. We had ballot measures in several states. We had the, the federal effort, constitutional amendment, voting rights act and, and so forth. Um, not sophisticated perhaps, but ultimately 
successful. And because of the efforts that we had, had uh, conducted at the state level for state legislation or, or referenda or initiatives, uh, the one that Pat was involved in Ohio being a, a perfect example, when it came time to, for ratification, there was a, a infrastructure, if you will, a political infrastructure that could go to work uh, to push for ratification. Uh, and, and as is often the case in politics and legislation, the circumstances uh, uh, dictated our strategy uh, and we would ju adjust it accordingly. Uh, now things have changed obviously in the 50 years and the way politics are conducted, the way legislation is considered and passed and so forth. But it is still important to remember the principle of the power of the people. <laughs> uh, voters, citizens can make a difference when they are determined to and when they're organized to. And in fact, I would argue today, uh, because of social media and, and, and uh, primarily social media, it, it may be in fact, easier to organize, harder to control the message, but, but perhaps e easier to organize uh, people to advocate for change. Um, this was, this whole movement uh, going to your work, uh, Martha, and that of your colleagues in the civics world, this was a laboratory example of civic engagement. Uh, uh, and it was healthy and it was positive and it was determined. And um, it was, uh, as I say, volunteers. Uh, we didn't have, I mean, there were a few of us who were paid uh, to organize things nationally, but not at the states. At the state level, everybody was a volunteer um, and, and it worked. Um, this is the 50th anniversary. And as I mentioned, it's being commemorated in states and nationally. Uh, and it's an, an opportunity, not just to remind people of the history, which is important, uh, but it's also an opportunity to remind folks of the precious nature of our civic institutions and of the need to preserve and protect them. And I don't wanna to sound too grand here, but, I think it can be argued that uh, the drive for the youth franchise and for the 26th Amendment was in fact a, uh, a concrete example of, try of people trying to make ours a more perfect union. Uh, and, and we ought to continue uh, down that road uh, uh, of trying to perfect our union in terms of uh, voting and engagement and so forth. So I'm, I'm delighted. I'm honored to be a part of this uh, commemoration. To, uh, and I, as I, again, I congratulate folks in New Hampshire who are uh, uh, the governor and the legislature and others who are bringing attention to this uh, truly historic uh, development. I mean, let me just say one final thing here. And that is there are only two amendments to the US Constitution that were driven by grassroots. One was the 19th Amendment, which was women's suffrage. The second was a youth vote, the 18 year old vote. Exactly. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate how you've painted such a clear picture of that time um, for capturing how the movement seeded and grew and succeeded. Um, so please stick around. Um, to participate in questions and answers um, with young representatives uh, at the conclusion of this event. So we're gonna have a brief um, interlude right now. Uh, Representative Rennie Cushing has agreed to read the declaration that comes from the New Hampshire House signed by Speaker Packard. Um, and after that, we'll, we'll listen to um, a performance by Catherine Turner of Manchester. Um, before we have our, our panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martha. Um, I have to just say that I think this is really great um, and I'm so happy to be part of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I remember the days when social media consisted of trying to find a mimeograph machine so we could get some <laughs> leaflets to hand out to people and forget about everything else. But it's important that you know, the same 
um, impetus uh, is what's behind all of our political organizing. So I just, this is, this is the resolution that the speaker signed, whereas the New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education and New Hampshire celebrate the ratification of the 26th Amendment. And whereas it is recognized that May 13th today commemorates when young voters over the age of 18 were given the right to vote. And whereas it is also recognized that this important milestone coordinated by the efforts of Representative Mel Myler helped unite voters in the Granite State to push this youth movement to the forefront and achieve ratification of the amendment on May 13th, 1971. And whereas Representative Rennie Cushing was also instrumental in ensuring this day would be remembered for generations to come and sponsored House Bill 273, which officially proclaimed the May 13th as Youth Franchise and Youth Office Holder Day. And whereas the legacy of this day continues with bipartisan support from Representatives Mel Myler, Sophia Wazir, Josh Query, Joe Sweeney, and Joe DePalma, now be it hereby resolved that the New Hampshire House of Representatives recognizes May 13th, 2021 as Youth Franchise and Youth Office Holder Day and be it further resolved by virtue of my signature inscribed below, the New Hampshire House of Representatives extends its highest accolades for the work and effort put into the ratification of the 26th Amendment here in New Hampshire and the significance that this day carries for our young voters. Signed, Sherman Packard, Speaker of the House of Representatives. of all members of the human family is the foundation of the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace. I just wanted to let everyone know that um, that was Catherine Thorner, a voice student at the Manchester Community Music School. Um, and she sang the preamble to the Choral Quilt of Hope by Adrian Albert. Thank you so much, Catherine, um, and to your teacher, Crystal Morin, too. So that was really lovely. Um, so now um, I'd like to um, very quickly uh, introduce uh, our panel of young um, yeah. legislators. Let me just make sure I have, have the correct 
I'm gonna make sure I have the correct names here. Um, so I wanna welcome Representative Joseph Sweeney, Representative Joseph De Palma the fourth, Representative Safiya Wazir, um, and um, Representative Josh Query. Um, so to our, our panelists, if you would please um, introduce yourself, including the area that you represent and how long you've served as a representative, your age, and what you do outside of your role as representative. And can we start with Representative De Palma, please? Hi, hey everyone. I'm Joe De Palma. Um, I'm 19 years old. Um, it's my first term in the New Hampshire House. Um, I currently represent Littleton and Bethlehem, and I serve on the Commerce Committee. Um, I'm currently a rising senior at Plymouth State University, um, studying business administration and professional sales. And so um, I I'm, live in Littleton, and I work for my family's small business up here. Thank you. Um, Representative Wazir? Thank you, Martha. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Representative Sophia Wazir. I am 30 years old and um, I represent District 17 in Concord, uh, Ward 8. Um, this is my second term um, and um, I am a mom of three children. Um, also, um, besides, um, I actually uh, do serve in the Children and Family Law Committee. Uh, besides uh, of being a um, full-time mom and besides of serving my community, also I serve on several uh, boards and um, I do a lot of activity of uh, uh, activism of, uh, within the Head Start program, which is it's a federally funded program uh, through federal and it's a preschool. Thank you, uh, Representative Query. Yeah, hi, I'm Representative Josh Query. I represent Manchester's Ward 9, um, and I serve on the Public Works and Highways Committee. Uh, I'm 27 years old, and uh, I am an artist outside of being a, a legislator. Thank you, uh, Representative Sweeney. Thank you so much, Martha. Um, I'm Representative Joe Sweeney. I represent the town of Salem. Uh, I'm in my third uh, term, non-consecutive. I served two terms from 2012 and through 2016, and uh, just got real. Uh, went for another term in 2020. I'm 27 years old. Thank you for the introductions. Um, so I'd like to ask you next to please describe your formative experiences as an educator. I'm always curious you know, what motivates people, what inspires um, people to participate um, and who and what prepared you. Uh, if you think back on your mentors or your teachers or your, you know, experiences that you had. Um, and I'm gonna uh, throw it to um, Representative Wazir first. Um, thank you, Martha. Um, I am, uh, first of all, I wanna say thank you to all our, um, wonderful leaders uh, among, um, I'm, I'm pretty honored to be here and um, share my perspective. And I am honored that um, because of their hard work, we are here and we've been able to participate in this voting and democracy. Uh, to your question, um, my advocacy prepared me um, and um, through the advocacy, I was able to meet um, so many people um, I was also able to um, meet with elected officials. I get to know uh, many people in my community. And um, I also noticed that my teachers at Concord High School were involved in so many um, issues ranging from uh, education, school board, and uh, into up until their, um, rental assistance. Um, also, um, getting involved in organizations prepared me to um, uh, one other unique thing about New Hampshire is New Hampshire is very a uh, political state and that makes everyone um, get involved and be prepared for, um, you know, either running for office or um, by voting or, um, you know, uh, uh, being part of the organizations. Um, at, um, one other thing that we have a big house of representatives and uh, many people are involved through that, either running for office or, um, you know, joining the organizations. 
Um, and I also want to say that my education also prepared me, um, you know, um, going to um, uh, going to at NHGI and getting my major in business helped me prepare and understand the budget in our state, how that works, and being able to compromise that and being able to fund a certain um, uh, certain uh, services in that way too. So, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Query. Would you yeah, like to um, do that next? Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I would have to say that it's it was a lot of my professors and mentors in college that kind of helped me um, find the the leadership inside of myself. Um, I was pretty involved as a freshman and encouraged to be involved in the student government at New Hampshire Institute of Art, which is now part of New England College. Um, you know, through the mentors that I had at that uh, time, you know, really helped me through uh, you know, multiple different issues relating to art, but then uh, relating to just advocating for the students as a whole. Um, and that led me to searching outside of the community within my college. So I was looking at Manchester as a, as a whole and uh, led me to start volunteering on some local campaigns, um, a couple of mayoral campaigns, and then led on to presidential campaigns. So, uh, you know, that really kind of led me to the path. And then um, seeing people who resembled myself run for office. Um, you know, I grew up in rural Indiana and I never really saw um, any queer candidates running for any office, at least not openly out. And seeing someone like Chris Pappas run for Congress really inspired me to, to run for office as well. Well, thank you. A representative Sweeney. Thank you, Martha. Um, I would say I think my involvement really started when I was 15 and 16. Um, I was really, you know, everything kind of comes down to the local issues, especially in New Hampshire. Um, and I was very involved in the student council in high school. And I actually really uh, appreciate and connected with what Representative Cushing had said on the panel earlier about the state uh, student council association. Because when I was in high school, I was I served as the president of that association uh, in 2011, 2012. Um, and I remember campaigning uh, when I was 16 and 17 uh, for local school issues that we were fighting for in Salem, um, and just kind of taking my activism from there um, and moving on getting more involved. And I actually remember registering to vote uh, from my high school cafeteria, senior year of high school, and then voting later that month in the 2012 presidential primary, uh, which is such a unique New Hampshire thing. And I just remember just always carrying that um, and haven't missed an election since and, and don't plan on doing so. Um, and just love getting involved and encouraging everyone to stay involved. Well, thank you. Um, Representative De Palma. Thank you, Martha. Um, in high school, I had the opportunity to intern with Littleton's town manager, um, doing a lot of economic development um, initiatives in the town. And that really exposed me to a lot of the more local politics. Um, and led to me testifying on a few bills down in Concord. Um, and I remember I went down there and I, I looked around the room and I thought way too many people's primary source of income is social security in this room. So I was, I was thinking, I was like, maybe it's, maybe it's time for a change around here. So um, ne the next year I, I decided to run for office and I, I thought it was a, a step in the right direction, but it was definitely having that exposure in high school to local politics and really seeing what's behind everything and having that opportunity to go down and testify on a few bills. Well, thank you. Uh, um, I'm noticing, you know, some common themes. It seems like mentor mentorship is very important, um, and also that experiential learning, right, of uh, an internship or student government or things that are are hands on. Um, if we had more time, I'd love to talk to you about, you know, that balance between content and and skills and and you know um, what you found most inspiring, but. Um, Anyway, uh, to move on, um, I'd love to ask each of you um, about, you know, quote, your generation, people, um, people who are um, younger than average involved in, in our, our government. And um, if you could please share um, if you think your generation is unique in any way, and if so, in what ways and what unique perspectives and tools you bring 
to this experience and, and to your leadership. Um, Representative Query, do you want to start us off? Yeah, um, happy to. So I think, you know, what brings us, makes us a little more unique is the amount of things that have happened on a national scale over the last, you know, 20 to 30 years. We've seen a major recession. We've now seen a pandemic. We've seen um, major terrorism happen. We've seen wars lasting for most of our lives. And I think that perspective uh, is unique to us. Um, I wouldn't say that we're any more unique than any other generation. I think every generation has its uniqueness and its troubles that it has to uh, comprehend with. But I think that that's what makes our voices unique at this current time is that uh, because we were born in these issues and raised in our formulative years or during a lot of these issues, you know, we, we've, had, we've been able to learn how to survive, right? And make the best of all of our situations. And I think um, perseverance is something that we have a little bit of a uniqueness to. And I think having that uh, in this difficult time of a pandemic is is really encouraging. And I know a lot of people, you know, need to hold on to that just so we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Uh, Representative Sweeney. I, I'm actually going to completely agree with Representative Query on that. Um, I think our generation has lived through a lot of things. I, again, I, I agree that I don't think we're necessarily unique compared to other generations that have come before us. Um, but I do think that we, especially in New Hampshire, there's an active uh, youth participation in our government. I think uh, between young Democrats and young Republicans in the legislature, I think it's over uh, 50 or 60 members now, which is really great to see. And it is bipartisan. Uh, we're seeing young people on both sides get involved. Um, and hopefully we can continue that uh, for the remainder of, of everything. But I, I completely agree with what Josh had to say there. Thank you, Representative De Palma. Yeah, I, I just want to echo what the two former speakers said, but um, I think another part of it is is we're exposed to so much being in the age of technology that we are at a young age, that it kind of it shapes our lives because we're exposed to far more than past generations have, just because we're constantly we pick up our phone and we see this, the news of the day. It's, it's, you can't really be sheltered in today's world. Um, so I think it's really shaped a pretty unique generation of Americans, um, just because there's no possible way to shelter your child from the reality of the world around you. So it's it's making people a lot more mature and and see, make them see the world at a at a younger age, definitely. And um, Representative Wazir. Thank you, Martha. I, I don't know what to say because our previous three speakers have said everything, but I do want to say that um, our generation is very, very active. And um, uh, with the isolation and the pandemic that we've been through, it's going to make more young, um, young people be more active than it is now. We want to tackle and we want to be able to uh, participate even more, even though the both sides are making phone calls, uh, door knocking and getting involved and running for offices. Well, but this is going to be even more and further with the pandemic and um, we want to tackle the pandemic and be over with it. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's about it. Thank you. I'm wondering if anybody would like to speak about, about um, the technology question um, and social media, because that can obviously be a really powerful tool for good, um, but also can um, create bubbles, right? So that we're only hearing kind of one narrative. Um, and I just wonder if you think that, um, if you have any ideas about that and, and potentially, you know, ways to pop the bubble and <laughs> or put ourselves all in one bubble together, if there's um, something that, um, that your generation can can do to remedy that. I'm not. I'm. I'm kind of throwing this out to anybody on the panel who. Does anybody? I'll, I'll kind of take that. I I think we need to start meeting 
when we, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that. I think again, and meet in our communities, it's meeting as a community um, and not just, you know, the members of your community that, you know, you agree with, but just anyone on your street, anyone in your neck of the woods um, and just talk to them and build that community trust. Uh, Cause I think that's something that we have really seen deteriorate in society. I think we have also have an issue where over the last, you know, 50 years or so, people have moved to areas where there are other people that agree with them. That's not been good for the discourse. And then social media just kind of took that situation and was like, oh, we'll amplify it 10 times and create Facebook groups or Twitter dialogues that are very narrow and very one-sided. Um, I think there can be a lot of good with social media. I work with social media all the time. Um, it's great to get a message out there, but it also has some really negative side effects that we need to counteract. We need to organize around. And I think that starts when we can meeting in person or even having Zooms like this, where you have two young Republicans and two young Democrats on a panel together, having conversations, because uh, we will find that we do agree on the vast majority of things, uh, that most things are not partisan. Um, I think we see that at the local level when it comes to local ballot initiatives and whatnot, all the way up to the top. Um, we don't have to allow ourselves to be defined by the things that media or national narratives want to define us as. Uh, we can really come together in community-based ways uh, to build cohesion and to work together on the things we do agree with. So I think social media is good, uh, but I definitely think we need to do better things with it uh, if we're going to see good results. Anybody else on, on that issue? Yeah, I mean, I would have to agree. Um, I personally, I, I'm not, I'm probably one of the only one in my generation. I only have a Twitter and that's really only for political use. Um, I, I try to make sure that I keep myself uh, out of a lot of that um, just so I can keep it grounded into, into the people I know, the community that I live in. Um, and I think, you know, I took it to an extreme level by, you know, not being on anything else, but I think uh, a lot of people could use the ability just to remember to, to go out and talk with your friends. Of course, we can't do that right now in pandemic, but like, like Joe said, you know, Zoom like this is perfect way to just kind of remember that we all agree on so much um, that, you know, Twitter and different social media is just kind of narrow it in on, on a few talking points that we don't, whereas, there's 90% of stuff that we do agree on. Well, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, so um, this is another kind of heavy, <laughs> heavy question, but I think it's really important um, to hear both your concerns and also your hopes as you look ahead from this moment in history, um, things that you're concerned about for our state and our country, and also things that give you hope. Um, so um, Representative Sweeney, would you kick it off, please? Sure, I uh, kind of just off the conversation we just had, um, I'd say I'm concerned about, you know, further loss of community, further uh, divides between all of us, just as granite staters. Um, I think the, the erosion effect of certain things um, are concerning. And there's a lot of other factors that we have a housing crisis in the state. Um, I know the people on this call, we've, we've tried to get um, more housing policies passed and we're still working on that. Uh, but we do need to really tackle affordable housing in New Hampshire um, if we're going to have more young people join us. Um, and so I think that's one area of concern that we really need to we'll work together on uh, to go forward with. And that's kind of the cost of housing, the cost of rent, um, are really areas that we do need to, to find. And there are just a lot of between zoning laws and, and barriers at work uh, that aren't letting the market do what the market should be doing in that sector. Um, and so that's one big area of concern. Uh, but I am hopeful because we do have such active people. Um, I do think that you know the, the long arc of history is going to be good uh, for New Hampshire and we're moving in the right direction. Uh, again, we're not always going to agree on every policy point or proposal, uh, and that's not, you know, we're not supposed to. We're supposed to have debates. We're supposed to leave it to the voters every two years in this state. They get to decide, and New Hampshire voters love deciding that they're going to 
elect one group one year and then two years later they're like oh we're going to give it to the other side um and we'll probably see that a lot more often uh, and that's the good unique new hampshire way and that's really part of our identity as a state so i'm, I'm very hopeful for all of that um representative query would you weigh in on that please yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, what gives, what concerns me um, is is burnout. I think we are such an engaged uh, group of, you know, people in our generation. Um, I'm really concerned that, you know, we'll spend so much of our effort and if things don't go our way or as soon as they do go our way, um, we've invested so much of ourselves that we will, you know, fizzle out. Um, I, I see it happen more and more. Um, so I think that's something concerning. And I think people need to remember to, to take time for themselves and to renew their own interests and hopes. And it's okay that they change and, and vary. Um, but, you know, at the same time, what gives me hope is just the matter of engagement that we have. I mean, we have more and more high schoolers. I mean, I can't believe how strong on both sides of the party our young high school groups are. Right. I think this is one of the most active years. I never had that. I wasn't politically involved when I was in high school. And uh, I think that that's just amazing to see how how engaged this next group of kids is, kids are. That's great. Um, Representative De Palma. Yeah, I think um, my biggest concern at the moment is just the partisanness and the divisiveness that's mm -hmm. in our politics currently. Um, and I mean, I, it's funny because I go to a state house session where it's very divisive day. And then I'm, I'm, I'm pretty down the dumps about, about everything. And then I go back to my small town. It has about 5,000 people. I go to a town meeting and you have these old guys stand up and they say their viewpoint. And the other old guy stands up and says their viewpoint. You know, they, they agree because it's a, when you have a small community driven initiative, really people learn to tolerate each other. And they learn to listen to each other. And even though those two guys will never agree at that meeting, it still gives you hope. And I mean, we see, at least on the young Republican side, I think we see record amounts of young people running for office. And I'm sure the Democrats see that as well on their side. And so it's really hopeful. And it's kind of bringing it back to that community-minded approach. Um, because when there's when there's a small number of people, you have to be tolerant of each other. And so it's kind of, kind of thinking about we're all in this together and, and really coming back to our community-driven roots I think that's really what gives me hope. Representative Wazir. You know, for me, uh, my biggest concern is that uh, as a mom of three, um, my biggest concern is that going through, um, you know, tackling the pandemic and stopping to this deadly virus. Um, while doing this, it's not easy. We still have to, um, we still have to work around and um, be able to serve our community and in a, in a healthier manner and mm -hmm. um, making sure that our families are healthy and our communities are healthy and um, um, that when we are back in our communities that we are not spreading any um, viruses to them. So within that said, um, and uh, my biggest hope and my hope is that both sides, we could work together and tackle any issues that we are facing within the uh, within this state and um, solve the problems in our state and uh, work and put aside our um, parties and uh, really work for our families and for our communities. Yeah. Thank you. I, I love that idea of, you know, at the town meeting and um, the same in, in my town. Um, if you even if you disagree with someone, it gives you a way to connect, right? So that you you're listening to someone and you may know them in a different way and you're listening to their perspective and you don't agree with it, but it gives you sort of like a playing field so that you can at least connect and understand where the other person's coming from um, on a human level. And um, yeah, so do you think there is, I mean, what are some things that you think you could work together on that you might agree upon um, and not, you know, focusing on the things that you, that you don't agree on, but are there some things, are there certain things you think you would 
you would agree on that you could you could proceed on. And I'm just throwing that out to anybody. <laughs> I think uh, Joe said it earlier, the, the housing um, access is something that uh, young Dems and young Republicans worked on last session. Um, and it's something that we've worked on this year. And I'm sure it's something that we will continue because I think it's one of the biggest barriers that our generation is facing to staying here in the state. Um, and I think having access to that is, is a super crucial thing that we, we agree on and maybe not all the fine details, but that's why we're working together is to see what works for the both of us. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more things about retaining our, our young people. Those are stuff that we will always work together on because, mm -hmm. you know, we don't want to keep losing our friends to Massachusetts or to other states across the country. We want to see our friends stay here and fall in love with the state just like we did. Anyone want to add to that? Or I think that's an important issue for, for a lot of people. Completely agree with Josh. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a good place to start. <laughs> um, so we have about um, 12 minutes left. Um, if you have any questions of each other, I'm thinking of, you know, some of the, um, the experienced people in this, in this Zoom room, <laughs> um, have questions for the younger people or vice versa, or just any old questions, um, you can put them in the chat or, um, you can just unmute yourselves and, and, and just, and just talk and <laughs> just ask a question. Uh, I have a question. I'm John Lewis. I'm also involved with uh, our civics organization. Uh, local, local control and local activity is a big feature of New Hampshire. And, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a feature where people can get involved and feel like they really can accomplish something. To what degree did that impact on any of you as you became more and more active. I can, uh, I can answer that one, I guess. Um, when I was an intern with the town manager, I kind of got to see a lot of the responsibilities that the state gets to put on towns um, just because um, it's that emphasis on local control and, and really seeing how really an initiative can completely change a community on that local driven approach and the impact that you can have. So, I mean, a lot of times we take for granted all those board meetings in, in our hometowns that have about five people in attendance, but those things really do matter a lot of times. And you really see that impact that those meetings can have and, and the rules that are made there and, and all the different bylaws have and, and really seeing how one initiative can, can change something completely. Because I mean, we worked a lot on tax increment financing districts when I was working with the town manager and we're able to completely uh, change and, and modify Littleton's downtown area completely just with one initiative. So it really is empowering to see that because, I mean, that's all happening on a community basis. There's no state involvement there really. Um, so it's it's a pretty cool thing. And it's, a, it's definitely something a lot of people don't know about New Hampshire. It's definitely something we should be proud of. Martha, you're muted. Thank you. Um, anything else about um, local control and how that influences how we work together? If I, not, I, I'll, I'll just add to that. Yeah, I, I'll just add that I think we are such a proud local control state. We do let a lot of decisions uh, be made at the local level, which is where it's closest to the people that are affected by those decisions. Um, I know when I was in high school, pushing for those ballot initiatives, pushing for the school changes that we wanted to see, uh, people's property tax bills in New Hampshire are their most expensive taxes that they pay. And the, the vast majority of their property taxes are from their local municipal government and school board. 
And getting people involved in those voting and that decisions is really, I think, where we need to go as a state. We, we see 60, 70, 75 percent turnout when there's a presidential election on the ballot. Uh, but all too often, we see 10 percent voter turnout um, or 20 percent voter turnout in local elections where local budgets are being decided. That has such a bigger impact on the average daily life of a resident of that community. Um, and I think we need to use the platforms we have to encourage people to get out of the cycle of just voting every four years and vote at your local. If you have a March meeting, if you have a November municipal meeting, if you have an April or May town meeting, uh, we need to encourage people to vote then as well, uh, because that is those are the elections for board of selectmen, school board, planning board, your town budget, your school budget. Those are the elections that are really going to impact you much more than electing state representatives or electing electors to the presidential uh, election cycle. So we need to emphasize that and use our collective microphones to get people involved in those elections as well. Thank you. We did get a couple questions. Um, I'm wondering if the voting age of 16 has come up at all at the state house. Um, I have heard of initiatives around the country where people are proposing that 16 year olds, you know, um, be allowed to vote locally, kind of to get in that, just like what you were saying, that habit of being involved locally. And just wondering if that had come up um, at any point in the, at, in the discussions at the state house. So I, I can take that. So I actually, I sit on the election law committee. Um, I know in years past, there's been moves to uh, one policy that I actually think uh, we should look into and study as a state um, right off the bat is if you're going to be 18 for the general election, but you're 17 for the primary, you should be able to vote in that primary. Um, you should be able to cast a ballot for nominating someone uh, if you're going to then be able to vote to ascend them to whatever office they're running for. So if you're 17 in September and you're 18 in November for the general election, we should make out an opportunity for people to be able to vote in the primary when they're 17. I don't believe, uh, at least not this year, we haven't seen legislation for a 16 year old uh, voting. Um, I know it's been discussed in the past, um, but I do think the first step we take towards that incremental um, is that at least, you know, and something I would agree to today um, is 17 year olds in a primary, if they'll be 18 for the general election. I think that's probably a good step in that direction just to see what impact that would have. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's a great first step um, towards 16. And I think um, we could really use that as a momentum builder right? Seeing how many 17 year olds who can be 18 by the general vote, I think that would uh, really push it right over the edge and make momentum grow on that issue. Something else in common. That's terrific. Um, so um, another question has come in. Um, would you all talk about your school student government experience and how much it influenced you. Um, and I'd like to throw into that question, um, was it, um, it seems like for some of you, that was a really authentic experience of student government. It wasn't just planning, you know, a party or something, but it was, you had some real voice in it. And so, um, yeah, if you all could weigh in on that and if you were involved, what it, what it was like and how it, how it shaped you. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll jump on that. Um, I, so I remember, you know, freshman year, so ninth grade, how, I forget how even old I was, probably 14 or mm -hmm. 15, probably 14, and uh, running uh, in an uncontested election uh, to be a class representative for the freshman class, um, and just loving the experience of being able to get up on the stage and talk to the entire freshman class at Salem High. Um, and then, but what I loved even more was the weekly meetings uh, talking with other students that I had never really gotten to know to know beforehand and just talking about what are small ways we want to improve our school. Um, and we would have a monthly meeting with the principal and we would go quarterly to school board meetings. Um, and then we got involved in the state level. And when we got involved with the 
state student council association, we actually had our election meetings and our state conferences in representatives hall in the state house. So I was 15 years old and that's the first time I sat in representatives hall in the seats where state reps sat. And I was looking around the portraits of him and, and, and you know, seeing it like, I really like this place. This is a really cool place. Um, and so I think that kind of first sparked an idea in my head that, you know, New Hampshire government's so accessible. Uh, here I am a 15 year old and I'm sitting in a state representative seat. And I just thought uh, to me, that kind of just opened my eyes and kind of showed that if you want to get involved, you just got to do it and eventually you'll get somewhere. Um, so that really my student council experience in high school and student government uh, was really transformative for me and really just opened up a lot of doors and a lot of opportunities that were just, mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have thought of otherwise. So I had encouraged student government to anyone. Yeah, I, I mean, I think student government, I was, uh, I was a freshman in college um, and uh, by some chance I was elected the chair uh, my freshman year. Um, and I was reelected the full five years that I was in college. Um, but that freshman year, my, it was really, like you said, it was like a pizza party panel, right? Like that's all we did. We, we mm -hmm. threw pizza parties and I think that's all we knew that we could do, um, before then. And what I decided to, to do was to try and fight so that, okay, so we have this money sitting around to throw pizza parties. Let's not use it for that. Let's use it to the betterment of the students. And so I was able to convince the, the board of directors to give us a seat at the table on the board of trustees. Um, so we got two positions out of that. And they then decided to give us the entire $130,000 student activities budget um, to have full control over. Um, and we started using that to, to influence the school safety um, because at the time that was in downtown Manchester, right around Victory Park, which was... Um, not necessarily the safest place to go. And, you know, here we had 18 year olds walking with, you know, $10,000 cameras and their $5,000 MacBooks. Uh, we had them walking. So we made sure that there were safety boxes um, for phones on, on the corner of the park. Um, we made sure that there are AEDs, you know, automated defibrillators right in the, in every school building, because at the time we had to run across campus in order to get, if someone was having any kind of um, health, you know, issue. Um, so really making sure that that was changed, that students could actually use it to better their experience at college. Um, I mean, it was, it was such an, a crucial step for me to, to move on to, to actual politics. Well, thank you. Uh, I think Representative Wazir wanted to make a comment. Yes, thank you, um, uh, Josh, Martha, and um, other representative, sorry, I uh, represented Sweeney. Um, so I do wanna make a comment um, regarding the student government. Um, for my perspective and my, um, when I came to high school uh, at age of 16 to go to, um, so my history and my uh, biography is a little bit different because I didn't get the chance to, um, you know, participate in this. Uh, student government, but I did participate in my soft end of my sophomore year and my junior years because I was the ESL uh, student and I was really getting my feet dirty learning English, um, doing my homeworks and all that. So, um, but I did um, participate in school activities like a yearbook club and a truck where I was uh, running uh, for a, um, you know, for the um, other teams. So, um, but when I became an adult and was able to register to vote uh, after becoming a US citizen, um, it opened up so many doors for me to be involved. Um, when back in, uh, in high school years, when I took civic class um, in my sophomore years, um, I, I can't exactly remember if there was sophomore or junior year when I took civic class. It was, um, it was pretty amazing for me to know, um, to learn about the American history and the civic engagement and all that. Um, but uh, when I became a um, US citizen and was able to register and vote, um, it really did lit up and open the, the 
open up the doors for me. But before I was able to participate in so many, uh, in activities or in activism, um, my first uh, first activism started with Head Start that I mentioned earlier. Um, that um, I was um, able to uh, coordinate and um, uh, recruit parents and uh, work around and help them uh, be an advocate for themselves for their kids and um, working uh, towards policies and making sure that what's our best policies for our children within the program itself. Um, I, one year I was able to coordinate advocacy program for our parents and um, the, the number of parents who showed up and um, our speakers were there. And um, that was a great turnout. Um, that was a, a wonderful success for me. And um, I was proud of my work that I was able to educate our parents and um, really educate them to come out and um, say what they need to say and um, be a voice for their, uh, for their children. Um, well, thank you. That's I just want to add a little thing, and that's where the activism started, and that's where uh, my political view started, and uh, just the uh, uh, friendships and Oh, I think she's frozen. Um, well, thank you very much, Representative Wazir. Um, so I think um, Wendy, are you able to share that last slide? Okay. Yeah, so I just wanna thank you all for being here. Um, there were so many people who participated and made this possible. Um, so I, I just made a slide and I listed everyone I could think of um, who contributed to this day. Um, I really appreciate your being here and spending this time and even a few extra minutes uh, with us here. Um, thank you for being here to help us recognize and celebrate this very important anniversary. Uh, thank you for guarding our democracy, all of you, and for showing up for each other and working together to solve problems. Um, please visit our website, New Hampshire Civics, and sign up for our mailing list um, to be notified of other events like this. And um, please like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Um, and educators, please check out the great resources available, including two lessons um, inspired by this day designed by uh, Amanda McGuire. So thank you so much and take care and be well. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you everyone. everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.